for joining us. We're happy to be able to speak with you today. So we've heard a lot so far at this conference about how healthcare is kind of coded and paid for on the back end. And we're stepping forward a notch to talk about how treatments are evaluated up front, how they gain placement on formularies, how patients actually get access to new treatments, and how we ensure that patients are involved in that decision-making process. So we're going to talk about health technology assessments and the metrics that feed them, traditional cost-effectiveness assessment, which is generally fed by a fairly controversial metric known as the quality adjusted life year. So I'm Thea Roberts. I am with the Partnership to Improve Patient Care, or PIPSI. And PIPSI was founded out of the idea that patients need to be at the center of our healthcare system. And as we're making decisions about healthcare, we need to actually be consist considering the end user, the patient, and make sure that we are providing them with high quality patient-centered care. So for this reason, we were formed to advocate for the creation of PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, with the idea that patients really need, to, patients and people with disabilities really need to be included in the medical research ecosystem from the beginning. And we have been a, <laughs> we've been staunch supporters <laughs> and we, fought very hard for provisions in that to ensure that PCORI and our healthcare system writ large could not discriminate against patients and people with disabilities uh, in, as being too costly to treat and not provide them with the care that they need. And then I'm here with the International Foundation for Autoimmune and Autoinflammatory Arthritis. We just say AI arthritis for short. And I am also a person living with an autoimmune arthritis disease. And so our organization helps the 450 million people around the world like me, who, and like probably many of you out there who are listening, because these affect one in 10 people in the world. These are your mother, your daughter, your neighbor, your coworker. The average age of onset is 20 to 40 in adults and any age in children. So these are often chronic lifelong conditions that require the use of medications that are somewhat costly in order to, for me to be able to stand here and present today, for example. So our organization focuses on education, advocacy, which is public policy and research. And we focus on developing resources and guidance to help people like me who are living with our diseases. And we also offer them opportunities to have a bigger voice in things like healthcare. So we help with sort of with a mentorship. So that's a little bit about who we are and who's presenting today. And what we really wanted to focus on is what we will get into and what these health technology assessments are. And essentially what they're doing is they need to establish what the value is of a medication. So what is value? And I thought we could just talk about that for a minute. Uh, so value can mean a lot to a lot of people. I mean, for it could mean holding your child. It could mean being able to go to school. It could mean being able to stay in the workforce. I mean, what is valuable to you? And when we're look, thinking about these personal health assessments, how many years will I live? That's something. I mean, we all want to be able to live long, healthy lives and maybe good health. Maybe that's more important. So I was just telling Thayer actually when we were, we were talking before this, I said, you know, you can ask a lot of people with my conditions and they'll say, I'll give up 10 years if that means that I get 40 great ones. Because if I can't travel and I can't work because my disease is out of control, then really what quality of life am I living? So quality of life, what does that mean? Disease, disability, or does it mean I have this disease and this disability, but I'm having the best life that I can, okay? So when you're measuring your value, you need to think, how is this value being measured and who's measuring it? I'm gonna hand it over to Thayer, who's gonna tell you a little bit about health technology assessments. Yeah, absolutely. So health technology assessments, often termed HTAs, are these, um, 
large assessments and analysis that are conducted to determine the co typically the cost effectiveness of the treatment, right? So you have this whole, uh, and I'm going to move forward a slide here. So you have these kind of complex models that determine how many years of life and what quality of life patients are living under the you know, current standard of care and then how, what that kind of longevity and quality of life may be under this new novel care. A question that often comes up around this is value to whom? These assessments are frequently designed to determine value to the payer. It's how cost effective is this? How much, how can I pay the least and get kind of the, how can I, if, it, if I'm paying for a novel new treatment, is it giving me a measurable quantity of improvement over a previous one? If not, why would I not continue to pay for the lower, lower cost treatment? So that tends to be a very payer perspective, whereas from a patient perspective, as Tiffany was just saying, a lot of the perspectives are more varied, right? It's, can I hold my baby? Can I feed myself? Do I require a full-time caregiver? All of these kind of inputs matter greatly to patients, and typical traditional cost-effectiveness assessments based on the quality adjusted life year metric have a lot of trouble understanding and quantifying how that all plays in. So oftentimes you'll hear patients say, but you're saying that treatment isn't cost effective, but it provides me a huge amount of benefit because you know, I'm able to feed myself and I don't require a full-time caregiver helping me feed myself or something of that nature. So that's kind of the where we get into a bit of controversy about how HTAs are typically conducted, not all HTAs, but how they are typically conducted. And before you go, I just wanted to really point this out too, focusing on savings costs today. So that is something that our healthcare system is always thinking, how can I save today? But we have to also think about this quality of life and the longevity. What is this going to cost if you're on medications for 40 years? What if I could get on a medication that puts me in remission? Then I don't have to, and it, but it might cost more. So that's what we're really talking about is this health ec economics and what, how do we figure out this cost of a medication? Is this effective? And then if we're looking at how do we measure efficacy? Who's telling us that, well, you can or cannot have this drug because it's too expensive and we don't think it has enough efficacy to give you access to that. I mean, that's basically what it's coming down to. So we're gonna step into, so HTA that we just discussed is very, very common in other countries. It is used by federal health, federal health systems to determine what is and what is not covered. That's not the case in the US, but there has been a lot of interest in this type of assessment recently in the United States. A lot of organizations are trying to figure out how to do it, some well, some not so well, and there's been a lot of exploration by state and our federal government as to whether it makes sense here. So given this curiosity, we wanna kind of step back, break it down, and talk through how it works. So a metric that is typically used in traditional cost effectiveness assessment is called the Quality Adjusted Life Year or QALY. This metric is designed by giving a year of your life a value depending upon the perceived quality of that year of life. So for example, a person who is in perfect health would be a one, dead is a zero, and most conditions get a ranking along the sliding scale. So you can see here, for example, severe depression or moderate MS is ranked as a 0.5. Um, a, a kind of very concerning piece of this, how this metric works is that it can also give negative utilities. And what that means is that a person is it is more cost effective to let that individual die than it is to provide them with treatment. So you can see why there's a lot of controversy surrounding this. Uh, people, this is generally seen to be very discriminatory towards people with chronic illnesses and disabilities as you will always, so if you say have severe depression, you are always going to, a year of your life will always be ranked as half as valuable 
as a year of someone in perfect health when it's plugged into these equations. So there's been a good amount of controversy um, and a lot of advocacy against the use of this metric by the disability community. So I'm gonna take over and talk about a little bit of who's doing this. So I said, this is happening and who is doing it. And as Thayer said, this is not something novel. This is something that a lot of countries are using, but we also have to remember that our healthcare system is quite a bit different than a socialized healthcare system. And a lot of countries who use these HTAs and involve patients in them have a different type of healthcare system. So it might work better and be more accepted there, but it would be very difficult to take a cookie cutter of this, which is always focused on the general patient population. Okay, so it's always focused on a big number, not subgroups, not you being unique to me. Like if we have the same condition, doesn't mean we're gonna have the same journey with it, but in, in an HTA and a quali in particular, we do. We are all is one. Yeah, and it's worth noting, you know, Tiffany made the point that in a socialized healthcare system where there is a finite budget cap, this does, can make more sense. But there is substantial advocacy against it in countries where it is used to, for example, the cystic fibrosis community in Canada and the UK did not receive access to Trikafta until four to five years after patients in the United States had it based on these metrics and these methodologies. So there is a good amount of controversy kind of just swirling over what this means for patients writ large. And the reason that we have this slide up, who is ICE or the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, you may or may not have heard of them, but it is an, an independent health technology assessment group. And they are really known for running the health technology assessments here in the United States. They've had Boy, some, some not so favorable, I guess, from some patient organizations, um, but they are becoming, their use of qualies and the health technology assessments are becoming more and more utilized by payers in order to decide which go into the formularies. So we need to talk about it and people need to understand who they are and how they fit into this model. Now, I'm not going to give this whole equation, this math equation as you hear over, see over here on the side, but essentially this is an example of how a quali is used in this cost effectiveness analysis. And we wanted to make sure that it's clear that the quali is a method, it is a type of use of a cost effective analysis. There are other It's a metric used types. within this methodology. Yes. So, and there are other metrics and there are other methods. And I think it's important to note that, but this is the most common metric in the most common methodology. By the most commonly used group. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to also just, when, I, when you see this over here, and I know it doesn't look like a whole lot, the dots, are showing on the lower part that that means that they have figured out through the metric that the cost and the efficacy are good enough, the threshold is not too high, we can afford this medication, put it on your formulary. But if it goes above, then the increment of cost gets too high and that's when they say the cost doesn't match what we believe, what we're seeing in the math to give the extended life and the, and the efficacy. But the question is, who's telling us, who's deciding what that value is and what that efficacy is? So it essentially means you have these comparators, okay? So you have the cost of this new invention, this new drug, it just went through clinical trials, okay? So that's what they're, they're always comparing for the cost. So you've got the cost of new, and then they compare it to something. So we know the cost of the existing, and then they subtract that, and that difference is put into the equation. So, okay, there's $150 million, whatever it is, it's more than we have here. And so then they look on the bottom of this denominator and they say, here's the efficacy that we know of the existing drug, and that data is, comes from clinical trials mostly, okay? And then they do the same with the new drug. Also, it just got out of market, so we've got a lot of clinical data. And what's missing is real-world evidence, qualitative data, what patients are saying is important to them. But even looking further into this, the clinical trials don't include everyone. 
So we have a huge problem with diversity, equity, inclusion, health equity, where a lot of people with different ethnic backgrounds are aging population, not included in the same trials that are used to determine if something's effective. So that will skew the equation. And so it, it, the, go back to what I said also, remembering that the quality is based on that average person. So if the average person is in a clinical trial, I know it can't be me because I have comorbidities. And 70% of the people who have comorbidities, can't, you can't be in a trial if you have a comorbidity. Okay, so that adds to this level again, and we can't consider that you and I are different. Or maybe there's thousands of us that are different, but we don't fit into the cookie cutter million. So, you know, Tiffany got into what's, what's the problem, what's the issue, why are we talking about this, and why does it affect day-to-day -day patient care? So, from the perspective of the patient advocate, you know, we truly believe that clinical decisions should be made between the provider and the patient, making sure that you're getting the best patient care possible. Cost certainly factors in when you're talking about a patient's out-of-pocket cost, what they feel comfortable paying for, how that factors into their whole kind of package of treatment. But a treatment, sh they should not be deemed off the bat too expensive to treat a treatment that, is going that could help them, you know, sh should be considered and should be talked about in the mix between the provider and the patient. So traditional use of cost effectiveness analysis, like those that ICER use, like that that ICER uses, relies on discriminatory metrics like quality adjusted life years and similar one size fits all summary metrics. There are more, there are some better. There probably aren't any worse, but there are some that are trying to get better. Um, it fails to meaningfully engage expert stakeholders. So when you look at how ICER conducts their value assessments, they will kind of talk to and engage to some extent patients like Tiffany who have experience in the condition, but they will rarely allow in patient reported outcomes, high quality patient data from patient registries, things that can give you more of a full picture of the value of a treatment. Um, the, treat the assessments that ICER conducts happen generally before the drug is approved by the FDA. So to Tiffany's point, the only data that we have to rely on is clinical trial data, oftentimes incomplete clinical trial data, so you're not factoring any real world evidence, you're not painting that full patient picture. Uh, there is a huge lack of transparency to their models, so one of the things that um, many patient advocates, PIPSI included, thinks are highly important with value assessments is an open source model so that you can see what's being factored in, what's being weighed, how. ICER's models are very opaque, they're hard to recreate, there are entities creating open source models, so it's feasible, it's doable, and we would encourage HTAs to move in that direction. Uh, and the real world evidence and qualitative data piece I put in there. Something that I will add here that is not laid out specifically on the slide is that these assessments solely capture the um, medical landscape, so they're only looking at medical costs. They're not looking at any societal costs, so they're not looking at ability to get back to work, ability to raise children, ability to survive without a caretaker. Those are all very real costs that patients and their families and our healthcare system are either paying or avoiding depending upon the type of treatment a patient is getting. So this, we, we stepped into the quality issue a little bit more earlier, but I do just want to kind of lay out the specific concerns about why the quality is discriminatory. So under the, when you look at a quality metric, extending disabled life is considered worth less than extending non-disabled life. So extending the life of a person in a wheelchair is considered less than extending the, extending the life of someone who's fully mobile. You can talk to people with disabilities, like someone who lives in a wheelchair, and they will say that their life in many cases is great and they have figured out how to adapt to their condition and still live a very full and promising life and they don't feel that their life is worth less than a fully mobile person. So that's a real big concern. Um, and then the, and I don't wanna, I know we have a half an hour, but there is a whole process of kind of translating the clinical outcomes into the utility scores that feed equality. And that oftentimes results in a lot of lost information. There is a survey called the EQ5D that is most commonly used to feed these quality metrics. And it's 
five questions with very broad outcomes. So like, do you, are you able to move? I have no mobility, I have some trouble walking around, I have full mobility. That lacks a lot of nuance. There are people, so for example, you can have a, an athlete in a wheelchair who would not say, I, am, you know, I have no ability to move around, but they're also not full, fully mobile. So you just aren't getting full clinical data when, that's, when it's handled that way. Um, people with disabilities may attach different values to their health than the general public would. So there are um, phone surveys that kind of feed the determination of value here and they'll call general public, you can call the, uh, excuse me, you can call a person in the general public and ask them kind of a base question. Would you rather be blind or dead? The person, the general public, is going to have a very different perception on that than someone who's blind who'll be like, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to be dead. I'm living a perfectly fine life blind. So you don't have that nuance that a person who's living with a condition can share about their life. Tiffany would be the first one to, to tell you that. Um, and then it cannot account for clinical knowledge in patient variation that is not in the research literature yet. That is hugely important when we talk about rare diseases with small patient populations. A lot of time it takes, times it takes decades to gather enough research to put that in kind of peer reviewed journals that are then reflected in these studies. Um, I'm not gonna go through these in bullets, I just the point is there's always perspectives. So here's more perspectives, and I've covered most of these. The only one I really wanna point out is that precision medicine. So we are work going into a world now where precision medicine and finding the right treatment for the right person at the right time, it's in cancer. And I've been speaking all over the country on it appearing now in our diseases as well. It's in early research, but it's almost ready for the clinical setting. And that means people like me might be able to achieve remission. That's not even a word that we know of. I know that I'm gonna be on medication for the next 50 years or however long, let's say I, you know, knock, knock, however long I live. But the point being, wow, what if I could get on a, on a, on a medication that was newer and I went into remission in four years? I mean, that's a big piece of the pie to give back, right? And so we have to start thinking about that and that we gotta look at that when we're thinking of, of, of that. And then the vulnerable populations, which we've already really talked about. I think. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump. No, yeah. that's okay. Yeah, yeah. With, with the vulnerable, so uh, talking about health equity. Yeah, yeah. I think I think we've covered most. Yeah, of we've this covered somewhere. most of this. Okay. So we wanted to jump in really to um, implications. You go ahead yeah. with the United the history. So I'm just going to quickly. I will. Scroll, we have like four slides on this. We don't need to go through all of it. But I wanted to make very clear that this isn't like some radical viewpoint that we're out here saying like rah rah rah. The quality discriminates. There is a 30 year history of opposition to the quality in the United States, dating back to 1992. Oregon applied for a what waiver to use a quality use the quality to help them determine their list of um, favored services under their Medicaid waiver. The then HHS secretary under the George H.W. Bush administration, Dr. Lewis Sullivan, sent it back to them and said no, because the use of the quality would be in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. There is a, um, a ban on the use of the quality in the Affordable Care Act, in the Medicare program. Um, yeah, this goes through the ADA piece. In 2019, the National Council on Disability, which is an independent federal agency, released a report, which is really great and will explain what I tried to do in 30 seconds in far more depth, Zach, so I would encourage you to pick it up um, on the quality. It's about a 70-page report. It's very digestible, and their finding was that the use of the quality in public programs would be contrary to United States disability policy and civil rights law. Um, it is a bipartisan issue. It is not something that we see one party or the other staking their claim on. Um, the DNC platform in the 2020 election specifically stated that Democrats will ensure that people with disabilities are never denied coverage based on the use of the quality adjusted life year. Republicans in the House of Representatives just as recently as two months ago introduced a bill that would ban the use of qualities. I think we will likely see that again in 2023 in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, and this is, you know, we are talking about this because if we were to suddenly start relying on ICER's assessments or, you know, any sort of quality-based CEA in the United States, we would see restricted access to care. 
So a significant number of patients would lose access to treatments that they are currently on. I'm not going to go through this entire slide, but for example, between 42% and 99% of patients across five disease areas would be required to switch treatments if Medicaid used ICER's judgments. You can see that 99% of multiple sclerosis patients in Medicaid would be required to switch treatments. This next slide lays that out for Medicare uh, in terms of the percentage of patients who could lose access to their current treatment if ICER assessments started, um, if the part Medicaid part, Medicare Part B started basing their formularies on ICER's assessments. So between 55% and 62% of patients across four disease areas would be required to switch treatments. Um, you can see rheumatoid arthritis right there, which lines up very well with um, some of the conversations that Tiffany has been sharing about arthritis and autoimmune patients. And then I'm going to talk just briefly about the benefits. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so there are people who do find a lot of benefits in Quali, and obviously they are very successful in different healthcare markets around the world. But they do, I mean, there is a reason, if we remove the quality, there is a reason for health technology assessments. We all know drug prices are very high. And so there, here are some quotes of, people, of what people are saying uh, for the quality. So I encourage you to also you know, see what all perspectives are, but really keep in, in also perspective what we're saying today, because these are from the patient perspectives here. And I just wanted to, of the one bullet I wanted to point out here is the, the argument, well, it's, it's, it's about the ethical principle of justice or equality for all and the healthcare. And that really comes from insurers. They have certain ethical standards that they have to follow. And one of them is, and the biggest one is the principle of justice and that they have to make sure that the pie is available for all. So they're working around that and trying to find different ways to fix this and that's for the people. So what can we do to ensure that the that these HTAs and the, the CEAs represent the patient reported value? There's a lot of legislative landscape happening. Yeah, and this actually probably, you know, belongs one slide, one section back, but just to make sure it's understood kind of why we're talking about this is this is coming up in the state and federal landscape right now. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act was just passed that does have a provision to negotiate drug prices. There's going to be a lot of conversation about how that happens um, and what metrics and methodologies we use to do that. Um, there have been several other federal bills that would have done the same thing, some that specifically implicated qualities like HR3 or Most Favored Nations, and a lot of states are trying to do this. A lot of states are saying, our drug prices are rising, we don't know how to handle it, ICER help us. We agree that drug prices are rising and that we need to figure out a way to curtail them, but we would encourage state and federal legislatures to do so, keeping the patients at the center of the equation and making sure that they are not discriminating against patients and not lowering their prices just by not providing care. And then I just wanted to cover before we wrap this up that there are efforts and to developing more representative assessments. And we've mentioned a couple, it's kind of hard to see on the slide, but the Innovative um, Value Initiative, the i -SPOR, these are groups that we are affiliated with that are really thinking outside of the box and coming up with some other methods besides the quality. And then, the, oh, sorry. Sorry, I just think it's <laughs> worth noting here. So Innovation and Value Initiative, um, or IVI, is doing open source value assessments, like what I was talking about earlier, they're doing multi-criteria decision analysis, so you can plug in different, different qualities and different weights to them and see kind of how it all plays out and see, you know, value one thing higher, one thing lower. It's just a very interesting methodology under development. ISPOR is actually the association of health economists. So like, they're not anti-quality. In fact, they're frankly pro-quality in some ways, but they are really, recognizing the need to incorporate patients more at the center of things and recognizing the shortcomings of the quality. So I think if you're seeing even the largest body of health economists say there's a problem here, that's worth looking at. So the other part of why I know that there, there is some light at the end of the tunnel here. So ICER, who we have been talking about, did launch an initiative recently to advance the support of health equity 
which is making sure that we're considerate of different people with cultures and backgrounds and ethnicities that we all have that equal consideration when we're doing the, the HTAs. And I know this because that's me. I'm on the panel. So there were, they picked seven people to sit in and I can report back that there is some movement to at least consider the real world evidence, things outside of making the clinical trial data the golden standard. So where this moves, we don't know, but the news is that there is some movement forward. And Tiffany's there trying to help it move in a positive direction, which we're all very happy about. So there you go. I think we kind of our takeaways here that they really are here. The HDAs address the high cost of medications, but what is the real cost? What is the value? How do we measure the value? Um, is, it, can, is it considered discriminatory by some? Some say it's not, but as far as the patient goes, we know that we need to have a voice in there and we need to be counted in what we feel the quality of life is. And there are metrics other than the quality that could be considered for use. And um, it's really time to have that conversation and work together to create a system that's fair and that value is defined in the way that patients feel it, is, it, it fits them best. Yeah. Here's some resources if you want to get involved with some of our work. Um, this is the Bitly AI Arthritis Voices, that's associated with, with my organization. Yeah, and um, at pipsypatients.org, I'd encourage you to, A, just to learn more about this topic, and B, you can sign up for Pipsy updates. ValueOurHealth.org is a group of patient advocates, which Tiffany has been affiliated with, that is really just focused on the use of value assessments and how they're being used well and how they're being used poorly and trying to make them better. So that's another place to look for resources um, and learn about where this is happening in practice. Patientaccessproject.org is a, another organization and that is just doing really good job, a really good job tracking where this is being used at the state level. So it's interesting and it's worth checking out.